Welcome to a Reimagine Mobility podcast series. I'm here with Chris. Chris has a tremendous experience and history in the automotive space. I specifically want to talk about what you've been doing over the last several years here. It's very intriguing, and I've read a lot of your posts, obviously, about it. So, but before we go there, explain a little bit your background, your history, and what you're doing today, and then let's jointly here explore the reimagine mobility opportunities we see in our future here. Well, thank you, Stefan, and uh, thank you to AVL for um, offering me this, this opportunity to um, talk about this project, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm British, as you can probably tell. Um, I've lived in America and in, mainly in the Detroit area for the last 30 years, working for Chrysler and uh, General Motors, um, heavily involved in the skateboard development at GM back in 2002 with the autonomy and high wire concepts and have about 50 patents on that. And then um, I could see the car was becoming a smartphone on wheels. So I decided to leave GM in 2012 and joined Qualcomm, which is a company that's inside pretty much everybody's smartphone. And um, for five years, I was uh, automotive strategy vice president there. And then uh, I decided to uh, kind of retire so I could focus more of my attention on the Africa project, which I'll describe shortly. And then I was called out of retirement by Waymo um, to be chief engineer on their future vehicle or future robo taxi program and moved to uh, the Bay Area to work there. And, but I, I left um, pretty soon after joining because I could realize that the real robo taxi was far away from being uh, ready to scale. And uh, only when you're ready to scale does it make sense to do a, a clean sheet architecture. So for the time being, they're, yeah, they're using. Um, Pacifica minivans and Jaguar I-Paces and retrofitting that, which makes sense since it's still in the R&D phase. Um, but over the last uh, four to five years, I've been um, doing some independent consulting for government agencies and banks and companies around autonomous and electric vehicles, and also developing an e-kit um, for underserved markets. Um, the initial emphasis being sub-Saharan Africa and off-grid. Uh, rural agricultural type applications, but I see the same type of solution being uh, very sorely needed here in the developed world for last mile mobility and um, maybe even some indoor applications like healthcare facilities and warehouses and so forth. So uh, I'm very excited to talk about it in more detail and uh, looking forward to your questions and um, hoping to answer them as best I can. Perfect. Well, well, let's jump right into it, right? We've had other participants in our podcast that are looking specifically the same as you are from with a with a passion with a law for the people in the underdeveloped areas of this world that still as many of us sometimes kind of maybe ignore or forget is still the majority of this world <laughs> probably yes absolutely i say that my career is being focused on uh, the 10 percent of the world's population you know that live in the developed world and uh, now i'm trying to focus on the other 90 percent of the world's population yeah, well, yeah. Well, movie matters more, right? The ninety percent instead of the. Well, if, so. if we don't find solutions for the ninety percent, then whatever we do in the with the developed world is not going to really address climate change at the global level. True, true. So let's jump exactly right in there with with climate change, right? In the in the ten percent of this world, well, let's say maybe in five uh, in five percent of the developed world, or or again the total pie here. Everybody talks about sustainability now. Europe certainly is big into it. I would say China to some degree more than ever into it. We're seeing it more and more in Europe and in the U.S. But again, as we just identified, that might be 10% or, or 5% of the whole world, right? What about the rest of the world? I mean, they use equipment there too. They, they, they use machinery as well. And they need transportation, maybe in some cases even more desperate than what we do to really develop themselves and, and progress. So what do you, from a, from a sustainability, from an environmental perspective, also see with what you're pushing? Not just transportation, but also bringing the 90% into the sustainability and, and overall effectiveness of what the developed world, or a, a small portion at least of that, is trying to push with let's say that the overall sustainability. Yeah, I, I think um, if we develop solutions that work for the um, poorest people in the world, you know, let's put it bluntly, then um, those solutions are going to be very uh, affordable and practical for the developed world as well. And they're going to be very energy efficient 
because um, if you go to parts of the developed world, people are extremely uh, developing world. People are very uh, resourceful. They need to be, so they they don't waste material. They reuse it to a much greater extent than we do here. And in parts of sub-Saharan Africa and rural India, uh, by necessity, the only source of electric power is the sun and using solar power because it's it's not connected to a grid. And so the, the basics of a, uh, a solar-powered vehicle that is uh, using recycled or reused materials, and that could include batteries in the future as a second life application, and being right-sized, let's put it that way, they can't afford uh, vehicles that weigh 4,000 uh, pounds or, or much more if you're talking about electric vehicles um, with 100 kilowatt hour batteries and 100 kilowatt motors and so forth. And if you think about the industrial revolution and uh, the, the transformation of agriculture with just the addition of, you know, horses um, with one horsepower, it was a big difference versus human power. So very modest power requirements and energy requirements can transform people's lives and, and, and really make a big difference in giving them ep economic development opportunities that they don't have today. Um, a simple example of that would be if, if you look at um, rural areas in many parts of the world, um, the produce that is grown, you know, vegetables and plants and so forth that are consumed, maybe there's extra that could be sold to m at market, but the market might be five or 10 miles away and uh, it's very difficult to reach the market. Um, and so a vehicle, a lightweight vehicle that may maybe with a one kilowatt motor and a maybe a two kilowatt hour battery, you know, trivial by Western standards, um, could really make it practical for people to uh, take the stuff to market, um, you know, when it's ready, uh, other, other than just uh, leaving it to lie fallow on the ground and go to waste. And uh, so it's a big, a big enabler. And also power, we talk about transportation, but the, the same solution provides electric power, which is equally as important. So my e-kit that I'm developing is basically the size of a briefcase. It contains um, a small battery, which in principle could be a reused battery, uh, roughly 48 volts, two kilowatt hours, um, and a small motor, maybe uh, one kilowatt motor. And then you have solar panels that form the roof. And this kit would be retrofitted to vehicles that they already have. So like a hand cart, because I don't want to be in the business of um, figuring out what type of vehicle makes the most sense, but I do want to uh, enable them to have electrified um, assist to whatever vehicle they're comfortable using today, which is typically a hand cart or a wheelbarrow. Um, in healthcare facilities, which I think is quite interesting, it could be a wheelchair or a hospital bed or a linen cart or a meal cart. Um, but again, this idea of a retrofit kit that can be universally applied to any non-motorized vehicle is the overriding uh, approach that I'm trying to take here rather than trying to develop a vehicle per se. And if you have such a kit, it not only can provide electric power assist, making it much easier to transport people and goods, but it also provides much needed electric power. So charging cell phones is an obvious example. People today will charge, will pay 15 cents uh, to for somebody to charge their phone in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's a lot of money. If you think about the average income of uh, people in sub-Saharan Africa is $2 a day. Um, so charging cell phones, pumping water, in many parts of the, the world, especially those affected by climate change, you're beginning to see um, erratic uh, rainfall and uh, droughts uh, that are occurring. Um, if you could have a reliable access to underground water, you could uh, reliably have three planting seasons a year instead of relying on the rains once a year. So you could triple your income. But again, that needs electric power or hydraulic power to access that water that's underground. Uh, in a healthcare application, it could be... Uh, powering a, a ventilator um, or a dialysis machine. So the the idea of a kit that can uh, provide power assist to an existing non-motorized vehicle and also be able to charge or power electrical devices uh, on the go is, is a very powerful idea in my opinion. And my vision is that this kit would be so simple that it could be assembled locally. And that could be in sub-Saharan Africa in a big city like uh, Nairobi, or Harare, um, where there's the resources to assemble this kit from, you know, available components, but then it would be distributed uh, locally ne to nearby villages and rural areas. But take the same idea and apply it here in Detroit. You could uh, easily imagine uh, a, a small factory in Detroit 
um, cranking out these kits. You know, we have all the skill sets uh, you need in Detroit to, to make these kits. And um, it could actually be used to provide um, last mile mobility to tricycles to allow people to um, transport produce from the urban farms to Eastern market, for example. Um, or think about healthcare facilities where you have um, hospital beds and wheelchairs and linen carts and meal carts that are non-motorized. And imagine if you had a kit that could be shared among all of them because a bed doesn't have to be moved 24 hours a day. <laughs> it only needs to be moved a small amount of time. And then once it's moved, you can take the kit off and then recharge it and then use it for a wheelchair that needs a power assist, for example. So I see lots of different applications for this, but the, the starting point or the stimulation for this was um, my volunteer work in Africa that I was doing 15 years ago, even when I was at GM. I was taking what I was um, uh, developing at GM, which was small electric vehicles for, uh, for the Shanghai World Expo as a vision of personal mobility in the future, and basically applying that to Africa. Interesting. So, I mean, Chris, when you explained this to me, right, and we've talked about this before, it's meant, for lack of a matter more perfect sense, and I would say, well, duh, right? <laughs> so the question was, as we reimagine mobility, why why do I only really hear you talk about why about this? Why are there not other, other companies involved that, I mean, we're not the only ones that care about the, 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 the third world countries, right? Why are there not other ones there? Is this is this because at the end of the day, it's again a matter of, let's say, capitalism for a moment. That if I can't money, why make money? Why should I? Is it a matter of we're looking at it the wrong way? We're looking at it from a way of we got to find the vehicle that fits there versus what you're saying. No, we got to develop something that fits for everything. So this kit that you're talking about. But as as we're again reimagine mobility here and discuss these things in these podcasts. What are we missing? Why well, is it you push one for them, but not others? Maybe I'm uh, approaching this in a way that's um, counterproductive to, <laughs> to, to people who want to fund it, because my my um, vision is that this uh, this kit would not be uh, mass produced by a big company and then exported all around the world. Uh, it, it is to really empower local communities, whether that's in Detroit or whether it's in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, to actually assemble this kit initially from assembled components like uh, imported solar panels and uh, batteries, but ultimately potentially to make it, including the batteries or recycled batteries from used electric cars. Um, so my vision is really to uh, really enable uh, economic development for the, the most underserved populations in the world, not to necessarily um, make big companies richer. <laughs> and that's not a mess. So my endeavor is really a philanthropic in nature. So I'm I'm in this not to make money myself or to create a business that makes money, although that might be the right approach, you know, uh, enlightened self-interest and all that. But um, it's really to try and uh, find resources, funding resources or engineering resources, to put it bluntly, to take what's been developed so far and to take it to another level of engineering refinement and development. We've built prototypes. I've worked with local universities. We've, we've built prototypes and, and demonstrated them. Uh, we need to make it much more rugged uh, and lighter uh, and smaller um, and make it so it can operate uh, in a pilot program, whether that's in, in Detroit or in Sub-Saharan Africa or, or elsewhere, without it failing on the first day. You know, when you work with university students, they're really good at uh, designing projects, but uh, it's not really their mission to engineer and refine. Um, that's more uh, business does that sort of thing. So that's what I'm, I'm really looking for. That plus um, the business case, um, which I'm working with the University of Michigan to um, with a class there to really understand the business case. I, I do believe, and again, this is almost farmer's math, that... Um, this could make a lot of sense uh, financially. If you have something that could cost $1,000 or less, and if you go on Alibaba website, for example, you see a lot of kits from Chinese companies. Uh, they're not exactly the same as what I'm talking about, but they're they're on the way, and you can buy them for $300. So I, I firmly believe that a solar panel that's roughly the size of a car roof and a, a battery like two kilowatt hours and maybe a, a kilowatt motor and the associated electronics and housing and the wheels, um, that this could be made for $1,000. 
uh, or sold, I should say, for $1,000. Um, and that works out to roughly a dollar a day if you have a three-year life for the product, which I think is reasonable to imagine. Um, so a dollar a day is not a huge amount of money, especially if you can charge 15 cents to charge a cell phone. Because I could charge 10 phones easily in a day with this uh, kit and still have more than 90% of the battery capacity left for transport applications. And I would be paying the dollar a day cost of uh, ownership. Um, so finding out a, a business model and a, a financing mechanism is something that uh, I, I want the class to work on. So I'm hoping that with um, uh, support from a company to help take this to the next level of engineering development um, to build a real practical uh, prototype that could be used in a pilot program uh, and then with the associated business case that I could um, persuade or convince uh, partners that there's a real opportunity in assembling or making this kit and deploying it. And that's where I'm at right now. Okay. Let's let's take this for a moment and kind of move it into mainstream back to the development world, to developed world, sorry. So either Europe or the US. Over the last, let's say, seven years, let's say, seven, maybe five years, we've seen the rise and I think at the same time fall of companies, I think, that had a similar idea to you. Instead of saying, let's build all brand new electric vehicles, they said, here is a kit that you can upgrade your existing vehicle either to a pure EV or at least to a hybrid, right? We've seen it certainly in fleet sales. We've seen also in passenger vehicles. But I would say maybe heavily in, in medium and heavy duty trucks, right? But many of them I've seen gone away again. But but to me, it's a similar approach to what you're going. You're saying instead of coming up with a with the perfect vehicle for Sub-Sahara uh, Africa, you come up with a kit and you let the local people figure out what to do. And probably between you and I, if we bring it out today, in a year we go over there and we look and I say, I never even realized it could be used for this. It's brilliant. I didn't think of this, right? I think that's ingenuity. You talked about it before, but what did we miss then to apply this idea in, in the U.S. where I thought, again, five or seven years ago, these, these upfitters, so to speak, to that make a, a hybrid and maybe a pure EV out of a standard F-150 pickup truck or out of a medium duty Isuzu uh, uh, vehicle or something. Did we miss something there? I mean, you worked in the space, Chris, for again, 30 years. Uh, before you started looking at what could you do for the under, underdeveloped world, did we miss something? Did we not pick up the right opportunity with these conversion or, or upfitter companies or were they just at the right time or at the wrong time, right place, wrong time, wrong time, right place? What do you see there? Well, I, I think it might, it might be uh, too early to dismiss the idea, even though some of those companies may have gone uh, belly up. Uh, I think it's, you know, as as companies are beginning to um, um, rethink electric vehicle strategies, uh, given the the materials challenges um, and the costs, um, there may be an opportunity for hybrids, you know, plug-in hybrids and so forth with smaller batteries um, that could enable vehicles to meet regulatory requirements uh, or, or just have a, a cost of ownership that makes sense. Um, so I think in places like Europe, many cities are looking to ban internal combustion engine vehicles from the city center. Uh, so the question becomes, do you use pure electric or do you uh, electrify an internal combustion engine vehicle, maybe as an aftermarket approach or a retrofit approach? And I think there's a it, it's something that needs to be closely looked at because it could make sense uh, given the challenges that these all these companies are going to face trying to secure enough material supplies with pure electric vehicles and especially with trucks requiring such large batteries if they're purely electric there could be a good economic argument for the extended range electric vehicle um, case um, but you know until recently everybody seemed to be uh, going from one extreme to another flipping from internal combustion engine to pure electric without thinking about, the, I mean, Toyota is an exception. They've been looking at hybrids for a long time. Um, but most of the US car makers were following Tesla's lead and um, just j abandoning plug-in hybrids, basically, um, to a large extent. And maybe um, 
there's an opportunity now to rethink that. Uh, uh, Going back to your idea, what, what kind of intrigued me listening to is, right, you sort of, with your kit, right, you would really solve the transportation issue. You would solve a uh, the, 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 the overcome the, the, the barriers of upward mobility from an economic standpoint, a standpoint for many of these people. But at the same, and many other things as well. But at the same time, and this is what kind of gave me an, uh, a wow moment, is you're also solving the infrastructure problem, right? Instead of coming up with the large charging stations and coming up with a solution of whatever, sending kilowatt of power over high power cables to remote places, you're saying, no, 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 no. Just like we're talking micro mobility, I think you're talking microgrid to some. Absolutely. And those are already beginning to take really? off in Africa, you know, to, uh, to supply lighting, LED lighting, and um, uh, cell phone charging, uh, good applications of that. So uh, it's out of necessity, um, but it, it could be the future, uh, just like they, they leapfrogged America when it came to finance uh, uh, payments, you know, being electronic uh, and, and wireless communications for tele telephony. So um, I think it's it's true. The improvements that are being made in solar panels and batteries are really beginning to um, to filter down now to the, the poorest parts of the world. And, um, you know, whether this uh, solar panel is part of the vehicle itself, so the vehicle can basically stay charged as it goes, or whether it's part of a um, the stationary um, in, inside the village, for example, and the vehicle gets charged, stay, uh, over, uh, not overnight, but uh, during the day and then it can be used the next day. There's pros and cons to that. Obviously, if you mount it uh, in a stationary application, you can optimize the angle of the solar panel and it's less likely to get abused. Um, but there's an advantage to having it on the vehicle as well. So you're not stranded as, as easily. But yeah, I'm, I'm open to both approaches. Uh, that, but they, So the kit is a basically a briefcase size kit. The solar panels would obviously um, be separate and they would be um, mounted um, maybe on four posts and provide shade as well, weather protection if it's on the, the roof. No. No. So so when we take this, Chris, and we kind of put it into perspective and say, let's say for a moment that's going to happen in, in, in Africa, okay? Let's say it's going to happen in Africa. What do you think would impact that would have for the developed world, so the U.S. And, and, and Europe for a moment, okay? It's not the only developed world, but let's stay with those two regions for a moment. What do you think, what impact that would have from the constant discussions we have today about micromobility? We talk a lot about it, but, you know, all I see is maybe some uh, some scooters flying around in, in, in California in back with, and half the time I fear for my life because they, if they, they come around corners without any you know, uh, helmets on and I myself are not ready. So we talk a lot about it, but I'm not sure we're really pushing it to where everybody is talking about or it's not getting there. We're talking about the constant problem, at least in this country, right, in the U.S., about the infrastructure as it relates to electric vehicles, right? Uh, what do you think, what would actually, not just the impact on, let's say, Africa be, but what would that successful implementation as we reimagine mobility, what do you see that would do for a country like the U.S.? Would we learn something, and what would it be that we learn from it, or in Europe as well? Interesting yeah. our perspective there. I, I honestly think Europe uh, um, is far more promising application here, because many cities in Europe are looking seriously at banning cars, not just uh, internal combustion engine vehicles, but electric as well, uh, because of congestion and safety and parking and, and those issues. Um, so if you ban internal c or cars in general from the downtown areas of, the, of many cities in Europe, you open up the opportunity to create a new class of vehicles that can be much lighter and don't need the crash structure integrity or the high speed capability or the long range capability that cars have. And they could be so much lighter and uh, cheaper to operate. And um, they could actually be made from a much wider variety of materials because, again, the structural requirements go way down. The riding handling, um, stability, stiffness, all, all those things change. So you could actually uh, open up the opportunity to um, re uh, recycle components, plastics, bamboo, wood. <laughs> we kind of s uh, smile at these ideas, but it, it becomes practical if you don't have to worry about crashing into a car 
or surviving a crash from a car and you're only operating at uh, 10 to 15 miles per hour, which is the traffic speeds anyway in the city center today. And as and as safe for similar to a bicycle speed. Um, so that you, you could get a, a significant fraction of the energy from the solar, especially in the summertime with such a lightweight vehicle, because uh, it would be so much more energy efficient than a car. Um, and, um, and so you could reduce the strain on the electric grid. Um, these vehicles could be made locally. I mean, that's not a great um, vision for car companies to think of local communities basically building and designing their own vehicles because they're so much easier. They're almost like golf carts. They're that simple. And potentially they could be autonomous in the future as well. But it's, it's a vision that I think is very exciting because mayors and um, city planners are, are looking to uh, solve traffic problems, obviously, but they're trying to create um, uh, jobs. And wouldn't it be a great um, mission to create jobs in, in the city, factories in the city, uh, design and development facilities in the city to create your own you know, vehicles? And you might export them to other cities as well. Um, so I think it's a great vision, and I think it, it could be enabled if you actually ban cars from the city center, which European cities are looking to do more and more. In America, it's going to be much tougher because I don't see that same movement in America. So I think the opportunities in America are more like last mile delivery, vehicles that can operate in the bicycle lanes. Um, but again, some people are, are, are concerned about safety even when in the bicycle lane. Um, but if cities can open up bicycle lanes for not only bicycles, but, you know, covered vehicles that could provide transport of goods and, uh, and low cost um, people movement, um, that could be an opportunity. Um, I did um, partner with another company to apply for funds from the uh, Central Station, the Cork Town uh, project. We, we became finalists with this vision um, or this opportunity to create a, a tricycle that is electric powered that could transport low income people um, in that area using the bicycle lanes. Um, so we were finalists, but we didn't actually win the award. But uh, I still think it's a, a good idea. But I think Europe is going to be further along. And then if you think about where the batteries from um, European car companies go at end of life, they might end up in Africa. And so that that could be a good market for these used electric vehicles in um, the batteries to go to Africa for the kit. Yeah, very good. Chris, I think we could go on here. I mean, I have so many more <laughs> questions. We're running out of time. So, I mean, very provocative, but... Yep. Again, very visionary, but also very, I think, very appropriate to what you're looking for specifically, again, for places like, like Africa. And, and certainly, again, I firmly believe we can all learn from, from this and, and, and kind of challenge our mindsets and, 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 and what we're looking at, how we reimagine mobility in, in, in places like Europe or, or the U.S. So maybe, Chris, to end it, a totally different question. I'll be interested in what you're saying because make sure you answer it with uh, you're going to buy a bicycle. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What's your next vehicle you're going to buy and why? Well, we have three vehicles in our household because uh, there's several of us. And um, we just bought a Chevrolet Bolt last year, EV, and we have a Chevrolet Volt uh, extended range electric vehicle, which I think was discontinued before its time. <laughs> I think that's a great solution. Um, I think that... Um, the challenge with buying another electric vehicle when our internal combustion engine vehicle disappears or runs out of gas, uh, so to speak, is the challenge in what happens when the grid fails or if you're stranded somewhere. It, 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 at this moment, it, it makes sense to have a, an internal combustion engine vehicle as a, as a backup vehicle. And if you go long distances, it makes sense to use that um, internal combustion engine vehicle. And I think most people who currently own an electric vehicle probably have a second vehicle because they're relatively expensive and you have to be relatively uh, well off to afford an electric vehicle. So I've never used a charging station in my life because the electric vehicle we have is perfect for driving around Metro Detroit, going to the airport and so forth. And if we need to go much further, we just take the internal combustion engine vehicle. So my vision is that um, car makers look at um, reducing the size of the batteries significantly in their vehicles. Making the vehicles smaller is a bit of a challenge, but making the vehicles have a smaller battery um, and having much better charging infrastructure. I think that's a much smarter solution 
then from a resource management and a national security and a climate change perspective than having huge batteries uh, in, in all of these vehicles. Um, so I, I would like to see more smaller vehicles that maybe have 200 mile range be, uh, instead of 300 miles. And, um, but to complement that with much more uh, intuitive and uh, ubiquitous charging infrastructure to put people's minds at rest. But at this moment, I don't have an issue with range anxiety because I always have a, an, elect, an internal combustion engine vehicle for really long drives. But I know that that's not a, a long-term solution. All right. All right. Chris, very good. Thank you so much for Thank your you. uh, sharing a little bit of all what's going on in your life and what your vision is and, and, and your passion. I can feel it and I can see it. Just talking to you and seeing you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.